I've been feeling a bit under the weather for the past day and a half or so, and so uh, I did not start planning a new video like I wanted to, but I still feel like there's a video I want to respond to real quick. This is going to be off the cuff. It's not even going to be animated, and it's not really scripted, but here we go. This is what are good questions to ask evolutionists? Q&A, Dr. Jason Lyle. Dr. Jason Lyle is one of the uh, PhDs who works for Answers in Genesis. He actually does have a legitimate PhD, as far as I can tell, in uh, astrophysics. So here we go. What are some good questions to ask an evolutionist? It's often very important in a conversation with a critic of creation to ask the critic to define his or her terms. And so we might ask questions of clarification, such as, what do you mean by the word evolution? The word evolution can simply mean change in a general sense. It can refer to the, the idea that organisms have evolved over uh, millions of years from one kind into another. It can mean the idea that organisms share a common ancestor. And so it's important that we define our terms before we begin the debate so that there's no confusion later on. I agree. It is important to define our terms. So when I use evolution in the context of a discussion about biology, evolution is the change in allele frequencies in a population over time. Now, in case you don't know, one of those words itself might need to be defined. An allele is a variation on a gene. So for instance, slightly simplified, humans have an eye color gene. So you have two copies of eye color gene one from your mother and one from your father. Now the difference between having blue or brown or whatever eyes is an allele. That same gene has different versions of it. So anytime the genetic makeup of a population has changed over time for whatever reason, evolution has occurred. This is the mechanism which drives faunal succession, which is the fact that over time creatures have gone extinct and other ones have arisen and that in the past, the living organisms that we see on Earth have been very different, in some cases extremely different to what we see today. It also then leads to a corollary that creatures share common ancestry. And while I don't think that it would be necessary to the theory, it does seem to be the case that all living creatures go back to a single common ancestor. This didn't have to be the case, and if you read The Origin of the Species, Darwin seems to hold open the possibility that there were one or a few original forms of life that gave rise to the life we have now. But currently, things like highly conserved genes across all domains and single form of the genetic code seem to indicate that there was probably one single universal common ancestor from which all modern life derives. We might ask, what do you mean by the word science? Science can simply mean knowledge in a general sense. It can mean knowledge acquired by the scientific method, for example. And so whether or not you classify evolution as science might depend on whether you're talking about operational science or origin science as another example. There is no such thing as operational or origin science. There is simply science, which is to say either it is the knowledge acquired by science or it is the act of performing science. The act of performing science is one in which one gathers data, creates hypotheses, checks to see to what degree these hypotheses are confirmed by future data, either through future experiments or in scientific fields where experiments are kind of hard to conduct future observations. Then those hypotheses which are not supported by future data are discarded or modified, or they are accepted and eventually can become a theory if they have for a sufficiently long time managed to go completely without having any contradictory evidence. That's it. The scientific method isn't any different if you're looking at an event from the past. If you're looking at a crime scene and you're using things like DNA evidence, uh, blood splatter patterns, fingerprinting to try and identify a suspect, you're not sciencing differently than someone who's trying to come up with a better theory of quantum dynamics or something. The science that we do regarding events in the past uses the same scientific method as the science we do regarding events in the future or in the present. There is no difference. The only reason AIG wants to create a difference is because it makes it easier for them to accept the science that 
more obviously works all around us. The science that allows us to have computers and running water and refrigerators. Because obviously all that works. But on the other hand, most people have less of a first-hand knowledge about the science that tells us things like where dinosaurs came from, where they are today, human origins. Because you don't look around and see that your computer works because Homo sapiens sapiens evolved from Homo heidelbergensis. So, yeah, you don't have that immediate first-hand knowledge of it. But the science works just as well either way. What do you mean by the word theory? Which can, in ordinary language, simply mean a conjecture. But in scientific language, it actually means something that has uh, substantial support, something that has uh, evidence that would confirm it. I'll admit, when I'm not talking about science, I use the word theory in kind of the colloquial sense, as sort of a educated guess. But when I'm talking about science, like I do on this channel, I do in fact mean something that is well supported and has undergone numerous tests of its veracity and never failed any of them. Scientific theories aren't proven in a logical sense because they can't be, because there could always be some kind of evidence that contradicts them. However, they have for a long time yet to have that happen. Examples of scientific theory are theory of universal gravitation, Einstein's general and special theories of relativity, and the theory of evolution. In addition to these, there are questions that we can ask to get the critic to think through his basic worldview. And so you might ask, for example, uh, you know, do you believe that uh, single-celled organisms eventually evolved into more complex organisms? Yes, well, single-celled organisms reproduce by simply splitting in two, but whereas more complicated organisms, multicellular organisms, uh, reproduce differently. They have the male and the female. Yes, actually, the evolution of multicellular life from single-cellular life is in fact a thing that happened, and it's been observed in real time in laboratory settings. So it's not just some kind of hypothetical like, well, at one point there were only single-celled life, and then at another point there was multicellular life, so there must have been a transition between the two. No, we've seen it happen. This isn't even hypothetical. It's not even theoretical. This is one of the facts on which the theory is based. Also, <laughs> you know, not all multicellular organisms have male and female. There are anisogamous multicellular organisms. Lots of fungi are anisogamous. Although, whilst many of them actually do have sexes, but none of them are male or female because the gametes are anisogamous and sex determination is only chemical. So, yeah, that's just not true. Plus, Many multicellular organisms can, in fact, reproduce by fission. Most plants can. You can take a cutting of many trees, put it in soil, it will grow roots and create itself a new clone of the original plant. Also, starfish and related echinoderms, as long as each severed half has a sufficient amount of the central nerve ring, then the parts that you cut off can generate into entire new adult organisms. It's amazing that creationists say these things that, yeah, okay, to everybody's, you know, kind of surface level understanding of biology sort of makes sense. But if you dig in even a little bit, the entire point just crumbles. And the thing is, I think Jason Lyle is smart enough to know that he's speaking nonsense right here, that what he's saying simply isn't true. And I say that because he does, in fact, have a legitimate PhD, and he's very well spoken. And, um, yeah, I'm pretty sure he's just lying to you. And so uh, by asking questions like that, it gets the, the evolutionists to start to think through some of the things that maybe he's taken for granted in the past. What about information in DNA? DNA has information, all the instructions necessary to produce you. It's a lot of instructions. Where did that information come from? Well, you see in the, um, if you read a book, well, it has information in it. You'd say, well, that, that information comes from a mind. Information, as far as we know, always goes back to a mind, brand new creative information. It can be copied many times, but it will ultimately have as a source an intelligence. And that makes sense, given what the Bible says about creation. God made those first life forms and put, put the DNA, the instructions in their DNA. And so uh, it makes sense, given what the Bible says, but it doesn't make sense if DNA came about by a random chance process. So there's actually nothing about information that requires that it come from a mind. When we measure information content, the way we do it is we have a certain number of dates that the next piece of this information, the next piece of the signal can come in. So if you're looking at a book in English, 
Every letter, punctuation mark, and space is a separate state that the next piece of information can come in. And to see how much information is in the next piece, what we have to do is look at it statistically to see what are the chances that the next piece of information is going to take on state x. So with genetic information, there are four options. And if the chance is equal that the next piece is going to have one of these options, like there's no preference in the next piece, then that is the maximum information content there. But the thing is, you can get information values from anything. If you put up a bunch of static, just the hiss that you get on a radio when you leave it between channels, that actually has an absurdly high amount of information. Because as it turns out, the human definition of information, which is to say things that we can understand and process in our brains to be meaningful, and the definition of information in information theory aren't the same. And even if it were, the kind of information where we think of as, you know, what we can process in our brains and understand still doesn't have to have any particular creator. If you walk outside and see a landslide, you can process the information about the, brand, the landslide. You can see that how many trees were knocked over, if some building was destroyed, the changes in the landscape, all without needing to infer that someone caused the land to slide and was in charge of every last detail of how it did so. So none of this makes any sense. But ultimately, you must get back to what we, what we might call worldview questions. And these are questions that get the critic to think about his basic, most basic beliefs about the world the way it is and how it came to be because we're going to find that in the evolutionary worldview uh, you just can't account for those things that are necessary for knowledge and so we must start asking questions about what's called epistemology which is the the theory of knowledge how do we know what we know well this channel isn't really about epistemology per se however i will say that one of the ways that we can say that we reasonably know something is if we have a lot of evidence of that thing and no contravening evidence or very little so what do I mean by evidence? I mean a set of facts or observations which are concordant with a particular interpretation, either more than other interpretations or exclusively towards that interpretation. So for existence, the fact that we have numerous transitional fossils, none of which were predicted by creationism, but which were predicted in some cases in fairly good detail by evolution, well then we have evidence for evolution. What we don't have evidence for is, say, a worldwide flood, since we know what kind of evidence we would find, and rather than finding that, we actually find evidence to the contrary, such as in the middle of these supposed flood layers, we have extensive evaporite deposits, which is what you get when brackish or salty water evaporates, leaving behind things like salt deposits. It's really hard to imagine significant scale salt deposition during a violent global flood. So, yeah. That's what I mean by evidence. And how is knowledge acquired? Do we go out and look at things? Is that how we acquire knowledge? Or, or do we, we do it by reasoning or some combination thereof? And why? Why is that the case? In the Christian worldview, God has made our minds. And so it makes sense that our minds would be able to acquire knowledge through a variety of different means, through thinking about it, and through, um, through observing, and ultimately through revelation from God himself. Yeah, we do it by some combination thereof in different fields. So for instance, in science, we have to go out and look and then create hypotheses about how the data that we're gathering can be interpreted. Whereas in mathematics, we can't go out and find a real triangle. They don't exist in reality. They're a hypothetical construct. Because mathematics is itself a construct of human minds, we have to reason about it. Now, we have certain rules that limit the kinds of things that we can do in math. And these rules are, again, created by humans. However, they were initially created by observing things. The idea of counting is one of the first foundational aspects of mathematics. And that was done by looking out in the real world and noticing that the rules of arithmetic seem to work. And from there, we've built up this mathematical construct. I'm not going to say anything about whether or not our minds are the products of God in some sense. But I will say they definitely are the result of an evolutionary process. An evolutionary process which in one particular group of apes strongly favored the ability to make inferences about the world around us. Inferences like, I see a track in the ground. It looks like a giraffe track. I'll bet a giraffe went that way. Maybe we could kill it and eat it. Or, I saw another member of my group eat this berry and get very sick, so I won't eat the berry. The ability to make reasonably accurate 
inferences about observed phenomena that are displaced temporally, such that I see a thing now, and I can imagine what caused it in the past, or what the cause of my actions now might be in the future. That's a really good survival mechanism, and humans aren't the only ones that have it. There's some good evidence that our closest relatives, chimpanzees and bonobos, can also do some limited degree of temporal displacement and planning. And so the only thing that you need there is for this ability to expand. This isn't some crazy unknowable thing. And it's true that scientific ideas about things like consciousness are still at the very beginning of being researched. And we don't have a great idea as to how consciousness arises from the brain. And in fact, hey, it doesn't seem likely, but maybe there is some kind of duality. Even if the brain seems scientifically to be the seat of consciousness, if you want to believe that there's something else besides the brain that's driving your neurons, that's outside of the brain, I'm not going to stop you. But it still is absolutely the case that there is every indication that what happens in our minds is directly correlated to what happens in our brains and that our brains are the product of evolution. Or metaphysics, which is what is the nature of reality? What is the nature of the universe? Is the universe two? Is it, is it one? Is it, uh, is it many? And uh, so on. I think here he's asking if there are multiverses, and I don't actually have a position on the multiverse or the existence of multiverses. It seems like the kind of thing that would be very hard to observe. So I just don't care. It doesn't matter. And it's also not really germane to the question of whether or not life evolved. Now, in the Christian worldview, the universe is physical, but it's made by a God who is who's beyond that universe. And so that's how we would answer that question as Christians. And well, it's, it's great that you think that the world was created by a, a God, but it's off topic for this channel. And even if it is, that still isn't actually evidence against evolution or the Big Bang or any of the other host of scientific theories that you dislike. Finally, ethics, which is how we know right from wrong. And those are very good questions to ask an evolutionist because you see, ultimately, in an evolutionary worldview, you can't have an objective basis for morality. It's just not going to work because there is no, there's no God. In an atheistic universe, in an evolutionary universe where things have evolved by random chance, there's no reason why you should have a moral code why those organisms should be obligated to follow a particular code of behavior. So actually, there are two things here. One is, without a god, there's no reason why organisms should have a code of behavior. That's one. And two, there's no source for an objective code of behavior. And these aren't actually the same claim. So we'll take them in that order, even though it's the reverse of the order that he asked the questions. So organisms form various ways of interacting with members of the same species on the basis of how that helps that organism's genetic information propagate. So for very social species, species where there's a lot of community and interaction as opposed to isolated species, what tends to help is cooperation. So for instance, when one zebra notices a stalking lion, it can signal to all the other zebras that it's time to run now. Or when one primate finds a stand of fresh fruit that's just now ripe, they can bring the other group in. And that way, the group as a whole doesn't starve or get eaten in the case of the zebras. So not only does this animal protect its own genetic information, but also protects those of relatives which have a high proportion of its own. This is called kin selection. If you can't keep yourself alive to propagate your genes through reproduction yourself, it's almost as good to keep your kin alive so that they can. All we really need is kin selection, which is obviously evolutionarily advantageous. And there you go. We automatically get codes of behavior. Now, the more intelligent and learning as opposed to instinct-oriented creatures are, the more this will actually be things that they do by learning or that they can think about it in whatever limited way they can. So while ants cooperate basically in the way that robots do, they just do it because it's what they do. If you look at primates, they have complicated social hierarchies that can shift and change and they have conflicts. And they even have conflict resolution mechanisms. In fact, if you want to look at some interesting conflict resolution mechanisms in primates, but that might not be entirely safe for work, check out bonobos. So for the objective morality, many people who don't believe in any supernatural would say that ultimately there really isn't an objective morality. But there are, in fact, non-theistic attempts to create objective morality. None of which, I'll add, have the problem of the Euthyphro dilemma. So, at the very least, 
they can avoid that. And all you really need to create an objective morality is to come up with a goal for morality. What is morality about? If you think it's just doing whatever a supernatural entity teaches you, well then, okay, yeah, you need one for it to be objective. But if you think, as I do, that the point of it is to minimize the need for interpersonal conflict, which rises to the point of violence, and to maximize the well-being of people as a second consideration, then in fact there are objective moral principles that you can derive from that. Because there are rules that you can set for society that will objectively help accomplish that goal. Now, other people can set other goals, but as it turns out, we pretty much all have a similar set of goals whenever we start thinking about what we would like to see in terms of societal interactions between humans. There is some variety there, and there are some marginal cases where we disagree, but that's still the case with Christians, even though they have this supposed morality driven from on high. If that were really the case, that it were just an unambiguously handed to you in the Bible, then all Christians would have the same moral conclusions about the same events, but they don't. And so, for example, I might ask, uh, how do you know that it's wrong to lie? I mean, we would all agree that it's wrong to lie, at least generally, and why is that the case? Well, in the Christian worldview, I can make sense of that because God has told us that it's contrary to his nature to engage in lying, and so that is wrong. But in an evolutionary worldview, why would that be wrong? Why lying is the generally wrong, and I agree, it's not always wrong, but why it's generally wrong is because in order to use language, we need to be able to trust each other. There's this idea that certain signals are harder to give to other organisms than others. For instance, screaming and running is a pretty high cost signal. It takes a lot of energy to get that done. So we very rarely think that it's not truthful. And that's one of the reasons why lots of animals can use things like that as a signaling mechanism, because it's expensive for them. So they're not unlikely to give that signal unless they need to. On the other hand, we can say almost anything with about the same level of effort, whether it's a lie or not, and that amount of effort is very low. So in order to be able to trust these low-cost signals, we have to have an already established norm that lying is generally not okay which means that we can generally trust the spoken statements of others, which is why you do, in fact, do it. It's because everyone is in this situation. And so, just like the boy who cried wolf, if you continuously show that you are dishonest, which you're actually pretty close to doing there, Dr. Lyle, then people won't believe any of the things that you say. In fact, they might start to think that when you say something, that's good reason to not believe it. So there's perfectly selfish reasons to be honest. It doesn't require any special moral code sent from on high to realize that if you want to get along in the society, which you have to as a human, that you should be honest. And so it seems that there's an inconsistency in the evolutionist worldview. On the one hand, he knows it's wrong to lie. On the other hand, he can't give a reason for why it's wrong to lie, particularly if it benefits my survival value. Actually, if it directly benefits my survival value, that's probably one of the times when even you wouldn't think it's wrong to lie. For instance, if an axe-wielding maniac is looking for me, but for some reason doesn't realize that I'm there standing in front of him and then asks where I am, and I tell him a lie, I bet neither of us would think that that was wrong. Or if you're pretty convinced that someone's trying to poison you, and they ask if you ate the food that has the poison, and you say, oh yeah, it was delicious, even though actually you just threw it in the trash, you'd probably think that was okay too. In fact, you would probably even think lying is okay, and I would agree, in cases where it directly benefits the survival of another person. So when the Nazis come knocking on your door to ask where the Jews are, and you have them in your attic, and you say you don't know, that's a lie, and I'll bet you're okay with it. And that's the thing. These moral principles don't actually change that much whether or not you have a Christian worldview. And so those are good questions to ask to get a person to think through his worldview. And if you're really good at asking worldview questions, you'll find that they actually end the debate because there aren't any good evolutionary answers to worldview type questions. Well, there aren't really too many answers to worldview type questions from evolution because evolution isn't a worldview. It just isn't. It's a single theory about the origin and course of biodiversity. That's it. That's like saying, oh, well, you know, those, those people who believe in special relativity, those guys, they can't tell me what ultimate moral truths there are in the universe. It's like, well, yeah, why would you expect them to? It, it doesn't make any sense. You're, ask, you're making a category error. 
evolution isn't our worldview. It's concordant with certain worldviews, some of which, by the way, are theistic, some of them are deistic, some of them are atheistic. It's concordant with a lot of worldviews, but it's not itself a worldview. So, of course, it can't give you a worldview. All it can do is inform you which worldviews can be excluded as false. And it actually can only do that with a very small number of them. That's why you can't get worldviews out of evolution. Well, that's it for the video. Sorry if this was a bit rambly. And thank you for watching if you liked it, which, let's be honest, you probably didn't because this was weird. Just give it that thumbs up and subscribe and click the little bell icon so you'll be notified when my next video is up.